A new day begins in Concord, Massachusetts, a small New England town approximately 19 miles northwest of Boston, its residents fully aware of the settlement's rich history involving the rude bridge that arched the flood, the Revolutionary War, the Minuteman, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Louisa May Alcott, Henry David Thoreau, and Walden Pond. However, a bit of Concordian history that is perhaps not so well known regards a 30-year-old building located on the old road to Nine Acre Corner. For many years, an insurance company's refuge, this building once played host to a thriving high school. With its athletic fields, an auditorium, and a gymnasium. St. Francis Xavier High School. I'm Jay Bellotti. It's not a common thing when a private institution closes its doors for good, especially when expectations are high. Well, that's exactly what happened here in 1971. Join me now as we retell the story of Xavier High School, or Xavier School as it was later called, sharing some special moments with those who brought this building to life, the former faculty members and students who walked these halls many years ago. Let's begin the tale in 1960. Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy was about to become the youngest man and the first Roman Catholic to be elected president. His close friend and head of the Archdiocese of Boston was His Eminence Richard Cardinal Cushing. It was a 65-year-old Cardinal's dream to find a suitable location for a Catholic high school in a suburban Boston setting, and Concord proved to be a fitting choice when a town farmer offered to sell one half of his acreage to the Cardinal, yielding 17 sprawling acres of farmland. Construction of the school began at a cost of two and a half million dollars. However, amid construction, the Cardinal would find himself with a major problem he would have some difficulty finding a suitable staff to man the school. He had, as I understand it, an order of sisters who had tentatively told him they would staff the place. Uh, and, uh, well, they backed out. They, they just didn't have the people. And there was a scramble. If I'm not mistaken, some order of brothers was involved for a moment or two, you know, briefly as possible people. But anyway, finally, <laughs> the story is told that uh, Cardinal Cushing went to the Jesuit Provincial and said, uh, you know, as, I don't know if you remember Cardinal Cushing, but said, you know, I want some of your guys to staff that school out in Concord. And the, uh, the Provincial said, well, where am I going to get the men? And <laughs> the Cardinal said, Give me the ones you were going to send to Springfield. So he knew that the Jesuits had thought of putting a school in Springfield and if the project had not materialized. The Cardinal's problem was settled when the Jesuits accepted the invitation to staff the new school. Founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in 1534, the official name of the Roman Catholic Order of Men is the Society of Jesus. They are especially noted for their work in education, directing an abundance of high schools, colleges, and universities in the United States alone. So the Cardinal's projected school now had a family. As a result, the Jesuit Provincial selected the very Reverend Jean P. Foley, formerly of Boston College, B.C. High, and Chevres High, as rector and head of admissions. 
I was the, the head of uh, Shepherds High School in Portland, Maine. And then it was decided by uh, Father Collar and the provincial and his board of consultors. In other words, he would have four men uh, there. You might call them his cabinet. And then uh, he called me in and said, you have a new job. You'll be the boss at the new high school that's starting in 1962. Beginning with the new principal, Reverend John R. Vigno, the remaining faculty members were notified of their new assignments in the summer of 1961. Shortly thereafter, the building was completed and the Jesuits gave the school a name. As I recall it, uh, we had a meeting. We had a meeting and uh, with Father Colloran, and it was decided uh, that it would be Xavier High School after Francis Xavier. There was a debate later on whether perhaps we might have chosen Edmund Campion, who was executed by Queen Elizabeth in England back there few centuries ago. So uh, I think you could say that um, it was decided at the top with, with Father Colloran and then some others called in on a consultative basis. The name of the school, uh, well, it goes back obviously to the uh, Jesuit missionaries. St. Francis Xavier was one of the earliest of the uh, companions of St. Ignatius and he was the one that went to India. Some went in different directions. St. Francis went to India and uh, did his missionary work there. And he is probably one of the five or six top uh, names among the early, early Jesuits. Xavier High School would later seek eighth grade boys that will constitute the first freshman class in the fall of 1962. And despite the fact that Xavier was a new school, eager to accumulate a ninth grade class, admission standards were high. It wasn't a question, it wasn't a question merely of saying, well, I'd like, I'd like to go there, but we gave examinations and then based admission on the quality uh, uh, and, the, and the, the grades in the entrance examinations. Entrance examinations were administered on Saturday, April 28, 1962, to students representing 44 cities and towns in the Bay State. Admission notifications were mailed to successful candidates in the summer. Theodore Lowney was the first student out of over 150 to be accepted by the Father Rector. I was real happy. I had the, uh, an early acceptance letter originally from Father Foley on the basis of, I guess it was the BC exam or something or other, that I had asked if they would accept that. And so I ended up being the first student that was accepted there. Naturally, others followed Lowney's lead. It was exciting. To, uh, to have been accepted there. Uh, I can remember being very exhilarated because I had applied to like Hudson Catholic and Marion High and those were the other choices, but I'd always felt that, gee, I'd like to be taught by, you know, by Jesuit priests. Well, I guess uh, I was happy uh, that um, I had passed the exam. I guess that was the, uh, the, the big thing at that point, just sort of looking forward to the fall. These first privileged students were given the opportunity to receive an outstanding Jesuit education at a cost of only $417 per year. $5 for the entrance exam fee, $10 for registration, $400 for tuition, and $2 for locker rental. At last, the Cardinal's large-scale project had materialized. It was no longer a dream that he would someday be responsible for establishing a Catholic high school in a suburban Boston setting. It was a reality. On Thursday, September 6, 1962, at 8.45 a.m., approximately 150 ninth grade boys entered Xavier High School for their first day of classes.
And just four days later, on Monday, September 10th, Cardinal Cushing visited for the blessing and dedication of the school. Of the cardinal coming out, and I mean the cardinal was God, you know, and you know kids there, and it was you know new school. It was you know it was a real up type of you know type of thing. Uh, we were all out in the parking lot, and uh, everyone had seemed like had blue blazers on, and their ties were right up tight on their <laughs> on their shirt, and um, uh, it it was um, we knew it was a very special event. And, uh, uh, and having Cardinal Cushing there was, was, um, was really interesting. Indeed, an era had begun with this group of boys carrying the torch as they set out on a four-year journey as upperclassmen, a journey that would take them through uncharted waters as they sought to establish an unparalleled identity, both for themselves and for their new educational institution. Well, I, that's pretty unique. It does not happen <laughs> to an awful lot of students in, uh, across the country to find out that they were the first class and the, and the trailblazing class through every single year. We were really uh, the number one uh, class as we were going through, and we could set our own uh, traditions, our own goals. We could make the school what we thought it was. And that's something that you just couldn't do at any other school. We did not have upperclassmen to emulate or to look up to or for acceptance. We, we were that class. We were seniors for four years, and that was a very unique uh, opportunity. Uh, you know, it's the senior year is your biggest year in, in school. It's just one of your most exciting years. We had four years of that kind of excitement. Well, that first graduating class, I think, was distinctive because uh, we were asking them, when they first came in, to set the traditions for the school and also the tone of the school. And uh, I, if, I, if I do say so, I thought they responded to that challenge handsomely. They were a splen splendid class in every way. The Jesuits of Xavier High School drew up some very specific goals for Xavier boys. These ten goals appeared on almost every piece of literature handed out at the school. The Xavier Ames, as they were called, would serve as a blueprint of what the Jesuits hoped a Xavier student would become. The class of 1966 would be the first to fulfill the Jesuits' expectations. I remember Charlie Hegarty. Charlie Hegarty used to teach an English class. Well, Charlie didn't teach you just how to dot the I and, and, and tell you about commas and stuff. He got into stories, plots, themes, and uh, really uh, lived uh, the way he taught. He wanted to get inside of your head and, and, and make things happen. And I think a lot of the teachers shared that kind of enthusiasm. Father Sheehan used to do the thing of you could not run in the corridors. And of course, we were, yeah, you know, I mean, you're 13, you're 14, you know, whatever. Lunch bell rings, you're off on a tear down to the cafeteria to be first in line. You know, it's, it's important to you to, you know, get down there. So Father Sheehan, who was a very big man, uh, would do the thing of hiding around a corner. So you'd come tear ass down the hallway whipping around a corner, and he'd grab you. He'd pick you up, he'd grab you by the front of the shirt, and just lift you up, and he'd kind of slam you up against the wall.
on. He'd, he'd give you a signal that you couldn't say anything, so you couldn't warn your buddies to slow down, you know, keep, couldn't run in the corridors. So th there'd be a line of kids eventually all up against the wall, and then you'd, you'd get detention that you'd have to walk the parking lot or, you know, like do some stu stupid thing to, you know, atone for your transgressions. But uh, it was fun. You know, I mean, th that, that was a funny thing for a guy to do. And it, it was a good-natured type of thing. Uh, but he, he was enforcing the law in a, you know, good-natured way. My club was the Karate Club. Uh, my brother and a friend of mine founded the Karate Club, and it caught on at Xavier, and it was uh, an awful lot of fun for us. playing against our arch rivals, uh, conquered Carlisle in a very critical game, uh, I believe in 1964. And uh, I had a very lucky game that day, and I scored well over 30 points. And um, I'll never forget the excitement because we just blew these guys away. And uh, they were supposed to be the, uh, one of the top teams in the, teams in the state. And to get beat by um, uh, Xavier High School, which wasn't renowned for their athletic prowess, was a, a real feather in our cap. And to be a part of it was very, very special. Judging for myself, uh, I would say I really taxed the kids. Uh, I remember getting stony looks from certain people in certain rows when they saw the quiz coming or they uh, were caught not knowing their vocabulary. Uh, I was a very demanding teacher at the time. And knowing the other teachers that were there, Father Moriarty in Latin, uh, Father Greenla in math, Father O'Brien in English, and other teachers, that they were deeply involved in the Jesuit tradition of working students to the best of their abilities. Xavier had a very strict policy. They had a strict dress code, and um, I can recall them uh, being uh, uh, very strict about 
uh, the length of our hair, as well as uh, we had to wear a, a suit coat and tie daily. And, um, but I think that was, um, I think that was good. I think that was a good discipline. Um, now to this day, I never, never bothers me to wear a suit coat and tie, and I think, um, I think it's helpful. They were, they were a very, very special class. Just an incredible collection of terrific people, and they've, they've stayed that way. They, they still are. On November 22, 1963, this group of students, then sophomores, learned the hardest lesson of their high school career, how to cope with death. The president cradled in his wife's arms, rushed in his blood-spattered limousine by the Secret Service to Parkland Hospital, and then we had word that as the priest came out of the emergency room, they said, the President of the United States is dead. As I remember, we were in history class, and um, uh, there was a uh, announcement on the loudspeaker that um, uh, the President Kennedy had been shot in Dallas, and that uh, it was unclear at that point as to what his condition was. Um, Everybody was just in shock. I mean, th this guy was a hero, you know, being Catholic, a lot of us being, you know, like Irish Catholics, everybody from Massachusetts, uh, seeing this, this guy was God, you know, and it, it was just absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning. As death often triggers a need for consolation, it was perhaps, among other things, this assassination of JFK that aided in the early unification of the Xavier community. There was a, a real close friendship there among, uh, among a, a lot, lot of us. A lot of, lot of school spirit, tremendous school spirit. This incident, I think, would, would typify the spirit of the school. Uh, just looking, say, at the athletic department, we had no uh, skating rink there. Uh, although some of the other schools, they would go to the, the different skating rinks in the area, hire them out, and so forth. But uh, there was a wonderful priest, Father Jim Greenler, and uh, he was the one that um, built a makeshift skating rink right there on the, on the grounds, the asphalt, asphalt grounds of the parking area right alongside of the school. And that's where the students used to, to practice and uh, before they'd move on to the regular rinks for regular games. In addition to the conceivable unifying effects of President Kennedy's death, many credit this premature development of school spirit and community to the buses. The spirit of the students was really engendered by the fact that the buses left late. When Xavier opened, of course, it was a school full of 13-year-old kids. They didn't drive, and uh, their mothers, they couldn't all be uh, running back and forth to school all day, uh, chauffeuring them. And so we had to lay on school buses, and we did. And we got school buses to bring the kids there early in the morning. That wasn't a problem. We contracted with some bus company. But we ran into a problem getting buses to pick the kids up as soon as school was over. Because these companies had contracts with a lot of school systems in the area, not just to transport the public school students home after school, but to transport a lot of their students to activities and games and things like that after school. So their buses, a lot of them were spoken for until later in the afternoon. So the earliest that we could arrange to have the buses come to bring the kids home from Xavier was four o'clock in the afternoon. And we thought this was a horror, you know, uh, this will interfere with kids wanting to come to the school and everything else. But anyway, we decided we'd make the best of it. Well, it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to us because what happened was everybody was there. As when school ended, nobody went home. The faculty didn't go home, the kids didn't go home. And there, was, uh, there were clubs, there were activities. I think it was one of the things that created the, the character and the spirit of the school that uh, is so unique and so memorable to those who experienced it. The trailblazing class of 1966 graduated on Wednesday, June 8th. A special class 
the tradition setters, the tone setters, the founders of the early clubs, the choosers of the Scarlet Knight. I think the first graduation, the first graduation uh, was uh, an auspicious occasion. I think that at that time when we had the pomp and circumstance of all of graduation and the first class was going, was getting through, I think that was, um, I think that gave the people the idea that this school was going to be a long lasting school. We knew we had had, we had given, that, that something had been given birth to. The students of Xavier High School would continue in the spirit of that first graduating class, but they would experience their education during one of the most troubling times in U.S. history, when the American lifestyle was influenced by the turmoil of the Vietnam War and the assassinations of both Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Thank you. We've heard an alarming report that Robert Kennedy was shot in that ballroom at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. These controversial events would create extreme social tension, resulting in public demonstrations and rioting. Many Americans would lose confidence in the government leading them to question all values, including that of authority. In essence, the U.S. would fabricate a carefree lifestyle, predominated by drugs and alcohol, and a conventional cry for peace would be heard cross-country. Indeed, the U.S. would experience big social changes, and even suburban Xavier High School would be affected. What it is ain't exactly I found a transition from the day I got in there, your hair couldn't touch your ears and you had to wear your tie and you should wear a blazer or, uh, you know, a, a quiet coat. By the time senior year we were wearing fatigue jackets, uh, the tie was on maybe, uh, you know, and the hair was way over the ears. You know, there was just, a, every year seemed to ease up a bit on that. It didn't seem to be the priority that it was when we first got there. I remember um, the discipline um, eased up. There was more of a, uh, a dialogue. You know, in the first year it was pretty one way. The faculty said something and you did it. By the senior year it was, well, why are we doing that? How can we change that? You know, and that, I think that was throughout the school. A lot of people that I went to high school with, and at least me in particular, had a lot of paid a lot of dues around alcohol and drug use. And I remember driving to dances at Xavier. I lived in Belmont, and I you know, was going 13 miles to school. I would drive from Belmont in my parents' car, and I'd be drinking vodka in the car as I was driving. I mean, I had a serious, but what I would now define as a serious substance abuse problem as a high school student. As both the country and the school were changing, rumors began to circulate that the Jesuits might leave Xavier so it was to make change in urban America where there were more demanding needs. The social change was also being felt by the Jesuits. You know, they were teaching us, and I think one of the driving reasons that was eating at them was to get into the inner city, that that's where things were happening. And I know I had talked, you know, to a couple of the teachers, and that was one of their big concerns is that they were missing, you know, this social change and this ability to make a difference was not happening in Concord. Since it was the mid-60s, there was awareness. This really wasn't where it's at. So there was kind of a schizophrenia in the education that a lot of the older clergy, I think, we're still on some of this model. Some of the younger guys didn't even know why they were there. They didn't really want to be teaching middle class white kids. Just like the Catholic Church, they, it was unclear where they really wanted to go. Do we oppose the war in Vietnam because it's really a bad piece of business and it's anti-Christian? Or do we support the war because we want to be good Americans? I mean, that was the crisis for a lot of 
uh, you know, Catholics in that period. And I think it was the same thing for Xavier in, in terms of the war, in terms of what do we really want to see happening at this moment. This is right after Vatican II. I mean, this is a period of, I think, real uh, confusion and a real broiling. And I think it all played out at Xavier in a way that now is really understandable in retrospect, because all those social forces were were uh, in operation, and it, it made for a really confusing period. Xavier was now saturated with great uncertainty regarding its future. Students entered the school day to day, waiting to hear the news that would mean the end. <laughs> And at the start of the 1969-1970 school year, Xavier adopted a new name, similar to its stable contemporary preparatory schools, in what may have been a final attempt to save the institution. Near the end, in the, in the dying moments, the, the, the death rattle of Xavier High School, uh, one move that was contemplated was changing the name of the school from Xavier High School, which is kind of a hoi polloi kind of name, you know, to the Xavier School, which is kind of like the Fenn School, you know, that's preppy. But changing the name of the school would prove to have no bearing on the future course of events that would follow in the months to come. After several meetings with the New England Jesuit Provincial, Father Vigno met with his entire faculty to advise them that the Jesuits would be withdrawing from Xavier. Father Vigneault met with the lay faculty members, as I recall, in, a, in an afternoon, maybe a Friday afternoon, and told us what the decision was going to be. We were surprised and disappointed. I can't say I was heartbroken. It, uh, I felt bad. I felt disappointed. But when he explained it the way he explained it, I understood it. I was disappointed naturally because uh, we were there at the birth of the school, and those of us who were there at the birth the first year, was saying, well, it's too bad. Well, uh, you know, it was a great loss because, uh, well, personally, I had been there from the beginning, you know, nine years, and uh, I had enjoyed teaching there, and I was very happy there. So it was a, a rather uh, startling announcement to me. On January 9, 1970, Principal Father John Vigno addressed the students and parents of Xavier to make the somber announcement. The public announcement was made to the parents, I believe, uh, on a January evening in 1970. Uh, parents were called in for what they were told was going to be a very, very serious and important announcement, and I guess 99% of them showed up, and Father Vigno got up and made the statement. He read a prepared statement, and he attributed the closing to partly to enrollment problems, partly to financial problems, uh, but also to a revised set of priorities on the part of the New England province of Jesuits. The Jesuits are leaving Xavier School. The years of rumor have ended with this simple statement. The Jesuits are leaving Xavier School. The years of a wonderful dream have drifted away, and a new vision begins to come into focus. The years of founding a new school, seeing it achieve renown in the best educational circles, ends not in defeat, but with honor and hopefully with vision. We as Jesuits have a heritage, a mark of excellence. We are committed to the greater good. We as Jesuits have no other choice. We follow that call. Father John Vigno, Society of Jesus. The announcement was not well received by the parents and students of Xavier, and Father Vigno's actions in the months to follow would create widespread speculation as to the real reasons for the school's closing.
it, went, it was first page news in all the Boston papers, and the, not just the fact that Xavier was closing, but this Jesuit's preferential option for the poor, uh, you know, was the alleged reason. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not being cynical about that reason. I'm sure that was part of the picture as in the provincial's mind when the decision was made. But it obviously roiled the waters and complicated things when Father Vigno, uh, within a matter of months, had left the order and the priesthood and married and had not, had not gone into the ghetto. He went into, you know, a very traditional lifestyle. Uh, I had the awkward task of preaching at the graduation mass in 1970 uh, when a lot of what was going on was still very fuzzy, why it happened, you know, and Father Vigno had resigned and his whereabouts were uncertain. Uh, the, the whole thing was kind of very difficult. I wonder what really happened to the school. I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what really did happen to the school. You know, it makes you want to go behind the scenes and say, hey, what was really going on there? It felt like it was a school that should have uh, survived, uh, especially where there was such, such energy behind it, at least during my stay there. I wonder what changed to make this, this school uh, all of a sudden become empty and void of students. I've always had a gut feeling, and I'll, I'll never know the answer to this one, uh, this side of eternity, but I've always had a gut feeling that somehow when the Jesuit Provincial came to that meeting and told us how it was entirely possible that Xavier might be the place we would give up for a variety of reasons, the way he kept asking the question was something like this. Uh, look, I keep getting more and more arguments that incline me to say I have to close Xavier. If you know some reasons why I shouldn't, give them to me, please. Uh, I've often, in later years, wondered whether he had some kind of information that he felt was um, private, that he couldn't use, maybe from some, something he knew about Falavino or whatever, that was, well, not exactly confessional, but along that line, you know, privileged information that he could not act upon and where he was looking for another kind of support for a different decision, and he never got it. While underclassmen at Xavier were offered acceptances to BC High in Cranwell Preparatory School, members of the senior class of 1971 were permitted to return to Xavier in the fall of 1970 in order to finish their final year in order to graduate. It was only fitting that Xavier would end as it had begun with one class of students. Surprisingly, as I understand it, it was not a year-long wake. It was uh, rather creatively done. They got a, a group of Jesuits there who, as I say, were, were creative and um, a group of youngsters who really wanted to be there, not be someplace else for their last year. It was a very difficult year, as you can imagine, that um, he had this tremendous building, large building, large facility, and they had been three years with undergraduates and everything. And uh, then all of a sudden, they were the only ones around. And of course, uh, I think even a whole wing of the school was closed off because it wasn't needed. Uh, so in a way, it, it must have been a, uh, uh, a strange feeling for a lot of them. But I, I remember it as, as being a, uh, a very satisfying year. And so a decade after it was built, Xavier would be no more. A school built from a cardinal's dream would, for whatever reason, only become a memory for those who had been there. Cardinal Cushing would die in 1970 at the age of 75, ironically the same year the announcement was made for the closing of the school. It's been 30 years since Richard Cardinal Cushing helped to seal the cornerstone during the blessing and dedication of Xavier High School. As time goes on, many will forget the history behind this building. Some will never care to know. But for those who walk these halls, the spirit and memory of Xavier will always live on. Thanks for joining me.
Uh, I miss the school simply not being there, uh, being there for uh, for other generations. Uh, I wonder, you know, what it what uh, what it is we, we passed on, other than a memory. Even though the building is in disguise, under the guise of a uh, an insurance building, the soul of that school is still there. They can hide it, but it's still in the walls. Uh, I wish. You know, we could wave a magic wand and open Xavier again. Um, I think the need is there. I think um, the place in the community would be well served if um, someday, that whether or not Xavier opened, a school like it opened. Thinking sometimes that might, what might have been if the school stayed open, nostalgia goes through my head when I visit Xavier High School now. In fact, I've dropped in there two or three times and, and um, the question asked me at the entrance by the receptionist, uh, may I help you, sir? And uh, I said, no, yes, if you'll just resurrect some nostalgia for me. I used to live here up on the top floor there with the members of the faculty and I just like to wander through alone.